In the second part of my reaction to Rebel Wisdom's interview with Ken Wilber about Jordan Peterson, I'm going to discuss briefly four things in terms of the theories of Wilber, JBP, and Robert Piercig's metaphysics of quality as far as I understand it up to now. They are the problem of masculine feminine order chaos, on mythic consciousness, the evolution of consciousness, moral progress, and a few words on waking up. As I explore the metaphysics of quality, I'm pleased to see how many resources are available. Through a few very dedicated individuals, there's plenty of access to analytic material as well as Piercing's original correspondence and writing. So it's thrilling to know I have more original Piercing to look forward to reading. I really wanted to comment in this video on the developmental aspects that Wilbur refers to um, throughout. I think it's very important, but but I don't know enough, so I'm going to leave that alone and just comment on what I know, uh, relatively speaking. And you, you just mentioned male and female, yeah. and that's, that's something that Peterson has been criticized for quite a lot. He, for equating the masculine with order and the feminine with chaos. Right. This is a theological point. And maybe it's a simplified theological point. Right. What, what do you make of that perspective? It's not my favorite aspect of, of what he does. Of, and he doesn't just identify, he doesn't say female is chaos and male is order. He says female is symbolic of, it, it doesn't make it much better though. So Wilbur doesn't like this characterization so much, and he thinks it's not that helpful for the most part. Uh, one great thing about Wilbur is he tends not to be absolute, and he, he's open-minded, and this is all the, the hallmark of an integral thinker, of a brujo. Um, he understands where Peterson's coming from. Peterson, for Peterson, masculine and feminine are constituent elements of experience, and for Wilbur, they seem to be more loaded in that the masculine feminine is more associated for him with actual men and women. When Peterson says chaos is feminine and order is masculine, he's referring to the ancient and eternal division based on, let's just say, statistical or on average characteristics observed over the course of uh, however many years you want to go back. You can go back to when, when the division began. And that's a long time ago. You know, the fact that men and women have been on this planet for, you know, a couple million years, um, there have been at least certain types of differences that we've noticed. If nothing else, women give birth and lactate. Men, on average, have a slightly greater upper body strength. The principles masculine and feminine are extracted out of, these, out of the differences between men and women, and these are archetypes. Using Persig's classic and romantic um, characterization of reality in Zen and the Art of, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, women are on the average um, more romantic, meaning they tend to be more inclined towards aesthetics, towards relationship, you know, because these, these um, things that are associated with are more in flux, they're more chaotic, versus men who tend to be more classical, meaning they're more oriented towards things, mechanics, th um, aspects of experience that are more orderly. Uh, although remember in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, John Sutherland is considered a romantic, so there isn't any kind of absolute demarcation when it comes to actual human beings in the world. I mean, you know, there's statistical demarcation. I guess uh, the the term I like from um, Heather Herring is bimodal. Peterson has been clear that every person has both masculine and feminine in them, and this comes from Jung. Everyone has an altern uh, an alternate archetypal personality inside them, which is the opposite sex. Men have the anima, and women have the animus, and a lot of shadow work is integrating your opposite. Peterson has spoken himself of the elegant but compassion, uh, elegant, compassionate but dangerous man who has integrated his anima. 
the alpha male is not the most vicious, but he's the one who is both powerful and cares for the women and children. In Lila, there is an archetypal story along these lines, and, and this is a spoiler alert. Lila is chaos, no doubt. Her friend Richard Regal warns Phaedrus not to get involved with her, as she will destroy him because she is immoral, sexually and otherwise. Regal is order. Much of the battle, let's say, in Lila is reconciling the two poles of Regal on one side, who is an older level of morality, who's Victorian morality, and Lila, who's, let's just say, anti-Victorian morality. In the end, Lila both wins and loses. She wins because her dynamic chaos that she's in in her madness would lead her through her madness and out on the other side should she be allowed to go through it. And that would dispense with the pathological and stagnant static patterns she possesses that are making her crazy, which is the outcome of the trauma of her tragic existence and her being rejected by civilized society. But ultimately she loses because the tyrannical father um, aspect, let's just say Regal, takes her way to be institutionalized, to go backwards. So the chaotic feminine in Lila could have produced in the same person a new masculine order of enlightenment. And remember that enlightenment is represented by the sun, which is masculine, along with a reclaiming of her nurturing feminine, uh, which had started to emerge in her madness. Had she been allowed to go through this madness onto the other side, according to Phaedrus, which she wasn't, um, she would have transcended this chaos. These are feminine and masculine principles that are played out in both pathological and transcendent ways. So it's much more complicated than male and female. However, in a way, I do see where Wilbur is coming from. And just FYI, as an example, modern Jungian studies integrating green to deal with this question for LGBTQ and uh, not in an unproductive way, in a necessary way as we become more accepting of the degree that the sexes contain the other sex and how we characterize this in our modern thinking. Um, and this is what green is for, it's to update, not, but not to bulldoze, it's too bad it's broken. Um, it's, it's very much undermining itself as we know. It wasn't that the, it, it, they just had it all bad, but they didn't have it all good. It wasn't like they arranged a society that gave them the best of everything and women the worst of everything. Because if they did that, they did a shitty job. Yeah. When it says, Moses parted the Red Sea. When that was first written, when the person sat down and wrote, Moses parted the Red Sea, they didn't have some deep symbolic meaning to that. It didn't mean, oh, the Israelites had to overcome a lot of problems, and we looked at our leader Moses, and he could he could help do away with with blockades like moving a Red Sea, and that was all symbolic. And then we moved out and found our own promised land. That's not what the person meant when they wrote. Moses parted the Red Sea. They meant this guy named Moses stood next to the Red Sea and he went whack and the sea parted and they walked across. That's what he meant. There's an amazing book called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian James, which was written in 1976, I think, which some of you may know. In the book, James describes his theory of, of how people actually were conscious of experience at that time. And in the book, James argues that everyone was rather schizophrenic and, um, and everyone had half of their brain where they heard voices um, and these voices were from the gods. This is how things got done from orders from above, almost literally, that people actually heard voices, commanding voices in their heads, telling them what to do. Um, Later, as language becomes more complicated, more metaphorical, this mostly went away, and that was somewhere between the times of the Iliad and the Odyssey in the 8th century BC. But there's still vestiges of it today. It it's, seems far-fetched, but it's a fascinating book, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, so I have a little story. So 
back when I first started listening to Jordan Peterson, he would actually answer email and, and respond to YouTube comments. Um, he had time to do that, obviously. It's been a long time since he has. So this must have been about 2015. So I asked him what he thought about Julian Jane's theory, and he said it was impossible because uh, there was an isolated tribe. This is my memory. There, I think he said this. There's an isolated tribe um, or more than one that are still in existence that are operating on the same level of uh, the people that who heard the voices so maybe their, their civilization is 3,000 years behind and they don't have this this voice hearing attribute but my question really is I know James was describing an actual physiological attribute um, at least that's my understanding, but I've always had this feeling that even if these people didn't actually, if this wasn't actually true, if they didn't actually possess this the schizophrenic markers in the brain, um, the schizophrenic state inferred from, from his research might be a metaphoric way of describing mythic consciousness. That is, it describes a person's actual subjective experience in the world that would be very different from ours. That would be a person who might believe that the Red Sea did um, indeed part, and that the descriptions of this type of consciousness in that book are very close to conveying the subject, the, the subjective um, experience of the time. So let's just say it does seem to me that Wilbur's right about Jordan Peterson on the fact that, that JBP isn't taking into consideration the actual phenomenological subjective experience as much as he should um, in the sense that, that for those people, mythic is real, not symbolic. But one of the reasons that he, he won't himself just say, yeah, I believe that. He doesn't believe Moses really parted the Red Sea, not literally. So that's not what he's talking about. And, and this is a little bit where the problem comes in. Because if you're going to do that, and you're going to look for these underlying rules and patterns, the really best evidence is that those unfold, those develop, those have changed. We don't look at human sacrifice the way we did 4,000 years ago. Piercing was very interested in the study of American Indians, at least on certain levels. And Lila is based in a lot of ways in critiquing the way modern objective anthropology studies them uh, through with an underlying subject-object metaphysics. So there are bound to be reflections on the Indians by Piercing, and here's one that I think um, kind of describes what we're talking about. My own opinion is that the intellect of modern man isn't that superior. IQs aren't that much different. Those Indians and medieval men were just as intelligent as we are. But the context in which they thought was completely different. Within that context of thought, ghosts and spirits are quite as real as atoms, particles, photons, and quants are to a modern man. In that sense, I believe in ghosts. Modern man has his ghosts and spirits too, you know. What? Oh, the laws of physics and of logic, the number system, the principle of algebraic substitution. These are ghosts. We just believe in them so thoroughly they seem real. I mean, you really can have a spiritual worldview that's magic. Um, voodoo tends to be an example of magic. Magic is the idea, and it tends to occur and developmental sequences fairly early because the human organism is learning to differentiate itself from the environment. And in the process where it's learning to do that, it hasn't quite succeeded. And so its mental image of a thing isn't really well differentiated from the thing. So it thinks that to manipulate its mental idea of the thing is to actually magically change the thing. So if I make a doll that represents you, and I stick a pin in the doll, I've actually hurt you. That's magic. So the Reverend Paul Vanderclay, whose work on Jordan Peterson and JBP's impact on modern Christianity, you likely know. Um, 
he did a really great response to the rebel wisdom piece and in it he critiques Wilbur's progressivism in that the latest level of consciousness thinks they're the best and most advanced but the problem is everyone um, at the time thinks they're the best and most advanced so is that level really more advanced and I, I certainly can't talk about this in a theological sense obviously but I like the question a lot because it made me think would you say morality is progressive? And um, let's look at this through the lens of Piercig. As far as he's concerned, I can see the answer being both yes and no. So yes, it's more um, it's more progressive because each level, um, as we saw in the in the map, which I'll share here again, um, each map, each level is more is freer, and more freedom allows more opportunity to be open to dynamic quality, to make quality decisions, let's just say, um, which is as far as, as as close to a definition of morality as I can find uh, in Piercing so far. Maybe I have this wrong. I still have a lot of learning to do. Um, but Piercing would also say no, because um, every stage, let's just say, believes themselves to be moral, and they are. The actual mechanism of morality is is dynamic quality and that's that thing itself dynamic quality never changes this is an eternal and this is I guess you could say Piercing's constituent element of experience it's the thing that you know that propels the universe um, so seeking quality that 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 leading edge of experience of quality what is better is always the same no matter how it manifests so for example let's just say, um, like Wilbur was saying, you know, a patriarchal system was the most moral at one time because it had to be if everyone was planning to survive. Modernity gets blamed for all of these horrifying roles, but modernity was halfway through the cure. They were starting to get rid of these agrarian roles, which were very patriarchal. Again, not necessarily just through oppression, but just through the differentiation of what the sexes did and the absolute brutality of nature and what we had to do just to stay alive. And that didn't include men having councils all the time trying to figure out how to oppress women. It was mostly men and women thinking together, what are we going to do to manage to stay alive? I think we need to get used to the fact that everyone thinks at the time they are in is the most moral. There can't be any other way. Intellect, the highest moral pattern in, um, in metaphysics of quality, or let's just compare it with Teal, puts us at a vantage point to realize that other people do not share our morality. Um, a concept that another brujo, John Haidt, Jonathan Haidt explores, he recommends <laughs> He recommends we we read How to Win Friends and Influence People if we want to bridge the gap between the two levels, uh, between two levels that are at each other's throats. So I want to share this tweet from another brujo, the comedian Norm MacDonald. The idiot sees the world as good versus evil. The cynic sees the world as evil versus evil. The truth that no one seems to be able to see is that the world is, and always has been, a battle of good versus good. And that being said, I'm embedded in this in this um, feeling like my morality is best as we speak because it's very hard for me to internalize that broken green, which should be functioning, is anything but self-serving. And that's immoral, as is the far right. But both of these are static patterns that are not taking in the dynamic. Too much devouring mother or tyrannical father and non-integral. This is pathology, and these are immoral. Spiritual intelligence. That's different from direct spiritual experience. Direct spiritual experience, that's waking up again. And we can talk a little bit about that, because Peterson is perfectly aware of waking up. He's absolutely aware of it. But he doesn't really talk about that. Which, waking up... In the um, Harrison Peter debate, Wilbur says neither of them addressed it, and it's and it's bizarre. 
And I think this is where Paul Vanderclay has issue with Wilbur because, and sorry if I get this wrong, um, this is my metaphysics of quality interpretation, which I'm still learning. Um, a Christian belief requires keeping some foot in subject-object metaphysics where you believe Christ, an actual man, and the Son of God, and God indeed, that all these are real and in fact are the ultimate concern, whereas waking up in the sense of Wilbur and Piercing, and remember Piercing was a um, Zen Buddhist for many years, for, for um, at least half his life. Um, waking up in the sense of Wilbur and Piercing does not require the subject-object metaphysics to, to, for them to be in their spiritual dimension. By the way, I get a lot of my present understanding of Christian belief uh, from the compelling case C.S. Lewis makes in, in Mere Christianity, which was given to me by my godmother, appropriately. And um, and that's a great book. And uh, Paul vanderclay has been very helpful in understanding that. In Wilbur's Waking Up, you can live in the pattern-based, let's just say the metaphysics of quality. So your spiritual dimension lives in one or the other, or both of these metaphysics, and ultimate concern is unity with the one, God the Father, or some combination of both. So I wanted to make this channel about how to live a quality existence in a practical sense, but I realize there are a lot of rabbit holes between me now and that goal. So thanks for bearing with me. I hope that made sense. And I'll see you next time.